so fortunate it's so close to where we live and work. The bright, fresh spring air, rippling, tumbling waters, vital green expanses of life. Well, maybe, maybe it's not what it's cracked up to be. Care to take a closer look? Then spend the next half hour with us as we look around our homes, our neighborhoods, our city. Have we a problem? Is it real or imagined? Or someone else's problem? Of all the definitions there are for pollution, perhaps the starkest is pollution, man's fouling of his own nest. We work and live and play and learn, all in our own filth. Yet, uh, look around at this scene of beauty and quietude. Is there really pollution here? Do we need to heed the cry of the 70s about polluted air and polluted water, about the proliferation of people, the unbearable clamor they make, the garbage they strew? There are quite a few kinds of pollution, and we have them all. Film for tonight's program was shot within Winnebago County. It's all ours. Pollution, fact or fantasy. Our story follows this message. Uh, let's look first at a form of pollution only the blind cannot see, although in some cases they may be able to smell it. Uh, take one insignificant paper cup, crumple it, and throw it away. An insignificant case of litter? Well, just look what you and your neighbors have been doing lately. Litter and trash, carelessly discarded or purposely dumped somewhere, cause more than just an eyesore. You and I, on the average, generate from six to eight pounds of waste products each day. It appears that some of this we're just tossing out wherever handy. And undramatic as it might be, careless litter is a most graphic example of our disdain for our fellows, our home, and our countryside. It's an advertisement for our willingness not to take a few extra steps to a trash container. And from the looks of things, there are few who can honestly plead not guilty. Getting it cleaned up is another matter. What is done directly costs us. We pay for it. What isn't being cleaned up is just sitting there, rotting, despoiling. And when it includes certain things like garbage, wastes, chemicals, it's also polluting. I think litter is probably one of the biggest problems and it's probably most apparent at this time of year before the grass grows up and before the leaves come out on the trees. Uh, I cannot understand anybody throwing their garbage in somebody else's yard or throwing their garbage in someone else's ditch. It's, uh, it's just unbelievable that people would be so inconsiderate to uh, dump papers and, and trash out of their cars, even on the city streets. Somebody has to clean this up. It's not going to go away. Once it's put there, it's, it's there. And uh, I just don't understand who these people think will clean it up after they dump it. A uh, litter is more than just an eyesore. It's pollution. And no industry is to blame. Just us. At least we can readily see this form of pollution. Harder to recognize, far more dangerous to our well-being is the pollution of the air we breathe. Remember your family doctor saying, take deep breaths? Wonder what the doctors in Gary, Indiana are saying these days. Right here at home, once in a while there occurs a particular situation that brings air pollution home without question. This is Rockford, last summer, during what is called a thermal inversion. Maybe you can recall how it affected you. Watery eyes, eye irritation, a noticeable haziness. If you suffer from a bronchial or lung condition, you may have found breathing difficult, arrested. The effects of such an inversion vary from location to location. Thankfully, they're not everyday occurrences. A temperature inversion, Joe, we normally think of temperature lapse rate off the ground as decreasing with altitude. A temperature inversion is just the opposite. The temperature increases with altitude. Consequently, it acts as a ceiling or a lid to any pollutants such as smoke, haze, 
that is coming from the surface of the earth and it is held at this base of this inversion. So an inversion is just an increase in temperature off the surface of the earth instead of the normal expected decrease in temperature as you go aloft. When a temperature inversion is in full swing, we all know what air pollution is, but we're not free from it during the rest of the year. Every time something is burned, air is polluted. It's as simple as that. And the list of combustion sources is endless. Automobiles, factories, power plants, trash, home heating units, the backyard burner, they all result in smoke, and the smoke carries pollutants, and the pollutants are in the air you breathe. The normal adult inhales 35 pounds of air each day. Schooling has taught us air is basically oxygen and hydrogen. Nowadays, it's also made up of carbon monoxide, sulfur oxides, nitrogen oxides, hydrocarbons, particulate matters, and a few dozen more equally undesirable elements. We as a nation add 140 million tons of aerial garbage to our air every year. We as individuals heating our homes and disposing of our refuse create 1,800 pounds all by ourselves. And what is it doing to us and to our possessions? Medical sources say air pollution is a major factor in emphysema, today's fastest growing cause of death. Air pollution and smoking are chief causes of chronic bronchitis. Affects about one out of five men between the ages of 40 and 60. Lung cancer is found twice as often in air polluted cities as in rural areas. Dirty air is shortening our lives with every breath we take. Polluted air contributes to respiratory disease and premature death. And what is air pollution doing to our possessions, crops, food sources, flowers, and vegetation? Annual nationwide damage, $500 million. Paint peels and discolors adding to house and clothing bills, polluted air kills cattle and destroys feed, rusts iron and tarnishes silver, cracks tires, deteriorates nylon, wastes fuel, and when it blocks out the sun, you pay more for higher heating bills. I naturally think that uh, air pollution is a problem. I uh, think the problem can be overcome. I don't believe it's going to uh, be overcome overnight. I think it's going to take a lot of research. It's going to take a lot of time. It's going to uh, take a lot of help from everybody. Uh, each individual is going to uh, have to do their part. Uh, Industry is going to have to do their part. Government's going to have to do their part, and uh, to uh, clean up the uh, bad things, the uh, carbohydrates and uh, particulates that are going into the air now. And uh, the only way we can clean this up are to put on the scrubbers and the stacks and uh, the bag houses and uh, cut down the auto pollution. In all, five hundred dollars per year per family is a fairly safe estimate of the cost of pollution and it's going to get worse. Do we have an air pollution problem? Well, this booklet, published by the Illinois Air Pollution Control Board, names eight Rockford Industries who voluntarily have committed themselves to provide cleaner air. Correcting conditions in their plants judged correctable. Now, there are others who did not make this voluntary commitment, but before you condemn all industry, what has been your voluntary commitment to cleaner air? Measurements are being taken of our polluted air. What is it that we're measuring? Well, in air pollution, actually, we are now conducting a series of six sampling techniques. Uh, some of these are for chemical compounds, and uh, two of them are specifically for particulate matter. In other words, particles or particles of dirt. It can be said that much of our pollution today is below levels currently set as acceptable. In most areas, those standards are being lowered. What we have now, and will have in the future, only time will tell. 
If a concerted, honest effort is made, our air may remain less polluted than others. If not, then will this picture of Gary, Indiana be ours in the future? Much like the air we breathe, we take the water we drink for granted most of the time. When the chemical purification gets so strong, we can both smell and taste it. And when the water turns brown, then we know something is wrong. And then we get excited. But what about the water in our rivers, our streams, and our lakes, and our deep wells? By and large, we're messing these up pretty well these days. Yes, definitely. I think there should be concern for water pollution. A lot of uh, drainage uh, into the rivers is uh, polluted before it gets there. I understand some people even dump grass clippings in storm sewers. This pollutes the water. Uh, I think we dumped some 188 million gallons of drainage oil into uh, streams, lake, and onto the ground in a year's time in this country. And I think uh, Things like this are definitely going to pollute water, and uh, we've got to think about our water standards from 20 years from now. Are we going to have any water left? It's water is something that we all kind of take for granted right now, and uh, we'd be pretty lost without it. I would say that we would stop all sewers running into the river, and uh, a lot of the factories are putting their water into the river, I would say we would have to clean that up too. Water pollution comes about from two main sources, the treatment or non-treatment of wastes and sewage, and the runoff of water from land. Sewage treatment is expensive, complicated, and necessary. With our separate storm and sewage facilities, in one respect, we're doing a fairly decent job. But as for the still continuing dumpage of wastes directly and untreated into streams and rivers, well, we seem to be doing a fairly good job of that, too. In the water sampling program, uh, we regularly are in a regular river sampling program of, of uh, whereby we, every week we collect samples of the river and we run a series of tests on them. Three of these are physical tests, which, which have to do with what we physically can see or smell in the river. Uh, seven are chemical tests for various chemicals, and then we run four bacteriological tests for the bacteriological quality on the river waters. Uh, we find that these do give us a fairly good picture of, of uh, just what is the true picture on Rock River waters. We must work on reducing the pollution Otherwise, we will not have any fish or wildlife left. It'll be a, strictly a desert if we do not work on it, and we should start working right now. The increased use of fertilizers and chemicals in our farmlands has resulted in the increased pollution of our waters in two ways. Fertilizers provide increased nutrients to algae, which can choke the life from a body of water. Chemicals, DDT especially, finds its way from land to water and then from the water to every living thing that uses it. And the concentrations of DDT in some fish and animals is so heavy that not only individuals but entire species are endangered, man not excluded. I would say it is a pretty black picture, but we do have some hopes because they have banned the use of DDT and the DDT is in the fish that the eagles and the ospreys eat, and that affects the reproduction of the bald eagle, American eagle, also the osprey. Well, maybe we don't need waters to fish and swim in. Unless something is done about cleaning up our waters, it won't be too long till we do find out. Can anybody really get too excited with pride about an annual carp catching contest? We have looked at the pollution of water and air and landscape, but there are two more kinds of pollution that we must consider. The pollution of people and the pollution of peace and quiet. Well, <laughs> I think he probably would start fighting for his life and uh, it gets pretty, uh, one thing we like is space and uh, the way we're uh, increasing population and using up the space that uh, in years to come I think you'll probably even have to uh, 
make a reservation years in advance to get into one of the national parks. To drive an unmuffled automobile down a residential street at night, and chances your popularity rating will be a minus zero. Noise pollution is an area long under study and concern, but just now getting serious attention from the public at large. Uh, yes, I think definitely there's a, a problem with noise pollution. Uh, loud mufflers and uh, heavy trucks and different things going down the streets. Uh, I think they've uh, come up with an 80 decibel right now as a, as a safe uh, decibel and they now have instruments to measure it. But we go back to uh, noise pollution back in Julius Caesar's days when uh, the people were complaining about the chariots riding through the streets of Rome and I believe he banned the chariots in the evening and also over to Queen, Eliz Queen Elizabeth's day where uh, you weren't allowed to beat your wife after 10 o'clock at night to uh, stop the noise. So I think noise pollution has been with us for a long time and uh, it should be uh, abated like uh, air pollution and water pollution. Man's annoyance threshold for intermittent sounds is from 50 to 90 decibels, decibels being the unit of sound measure. Pain threshold is 120 decibels. A loud power mower measures 107 decibels. And the only way one can safely appreciate the majesty of the jet plane, which registers 150 decibels, is on film. Noise will adversely affect the sick. An anginal seizure may be prompted in a heart patient by a sudden loud noise. Emotional damage, hearing loss, stress, all can result in all of us when noise reaches the level of intolerance. Now, we're surrounded by hundreds of noise makers. They can affect us just as can dirty air. In the future, perhaps, we'll treasure a little peace and quiet more than we now treasure wealth. Pollution has been brought about by a thing which itself is both a polluter and a pollutant, man. Today, overpopulation and zero birth are terms used with growing frequency. We have just begun to realize that the more of us there are, the more we all suffer from our neglects and deficiencies. I have been on this job for 29 years and I have seen the wildlife disappearing at an alarming rate. You can hardly find a timber without several homes being built in them. That will automatically drive out the wildlife, the deer, and fox, raccoon, and uh, if they continue to build it out in the timbers, I do not have much hope for good hunting in the future. The automobile is the worst polluter of air of any. More people will demand more cars. More cars will mean more air pollution. Do we get rid of people or cars? There's no simple answer to the pollution problem. What first must be done is for all of us to recognize that there is indeed a pollution problem and that it needs immediate action, collective action, and the deeds of the individual. Action now. We are all guilty of pollution, some of it perhaps more or less of necessity, others perhaps out of ignorance. We face interest groups demanding change and interests resisting change. But if we leave it up to the other guy to do, to some faceless, unknown person, then you're entrusting the air you breathe, the water you use, and your very health and welfare to some other guy who says he really cares. Much has been said about the generations of today, young versus old and so on, but perhaps the one and only thing that each of us share in common may be summed up in this statement by a leading ecologist. This generation is the first in history to have radioactive strontium-90 in their bones, DDT in their fat, asbestos in their lungs, and radioactive iodine in their thyroids. Thank you for watching, and good night.